So good afternoon. So uh, we've thinned out a bit. So on the theory of audience participation, which has been carrying on all day, how many oil industry people are still here? Oh, no, you haven't all gone. So that's good. That's good. Because this is definitely more of a session around general geoscience and a bit more about research and academia. So, OK. So you've had a number of presentations already about BGS. So <coughs> as head of data science, I'm left to hoover up what the other examples that we've had of some of the work that we've done, which I'm going to present here. But I've also taken a slight liberty with my, uh, my presentation. Uh, and apart from a quick discussion about a definition of big data at the beginning, I'm also going to talk a little bit more about some reflections on where geoscience is with big data, particularly against some of the other domains that we might otherwise benchmark ourselves against. Okay. Everybody has a definition about big data, and the one thing you can definitely say from the days that we've had for this conference so far is there's an awful lot of similar words being thrown around, and we all have our own views and opinions. So digitalization, uh, digital transformation, you know, machine learning and AI have been thrown around in almost every presentation that we've had, and big data is becoming really a jargon term that certainly every manager will use these days, and it probably means different things to different people. The three Vs has been discussed previously in some of our presentations, and at the same time, other people disagree with it. And I like the presentation from Halliburton the other day, when in reality, what we're talking about is all geoscience data. Really, we're trying to use all of the technologies that have recently, fairly recently, come on stream and allows us to bring all of this data together and maximize and assimilate all the information of many different types. So we are talking about volumes traditionally in geoscience, and I know this because I'm head of the data center. We're remarkably small, kilobytes, maybe megabytes. You'll be amazed how many multi-million pound programs can be summarized into a few megabytes of Excel spreadsheets, because that was traditionally where geoscience has been. But we are now into terabytes, and we're rapidly appro approaching you know, sensor networks and monitoring frameworks that can produce you know, easily terabytes and probably in time up to petabytes. At the same time, traditionally, and I can say it's within BGS, we've, we've had very structured databases and we've been working with Oracle for 20 plus years. So we have a very mature, robust database structure and we've defined very clearly aspects of, of those data models and we've loaded all of our data into those nationally consistent databases. You can't do that now with the range of data that's coming in. It's just too voluminous and too fast that it's approaching us and that we have to be a lot more flexible on, on our way of actually taking some of that and holding it within a, a, you know, a much more disparate architecture. And traditionally, geoscience was always very project focused. We did a defined project. It came up with a set of outputs. There was some data probably attached to that that then got handed on and stored. We've moved into the area of programs, quite large programs, and now we're into multidisciplinary programs and we're into real-time and near real-time monitoring frameworks and the societal impact of some of the work that we're talking about within the geosciences is where that's driving that, that, you know, that, that velocity of data that's coming through to us. So for my examples as we're talking here, I'm talking about the wider definition of big data. So what I'm really interested in is the software and the techniques that can be utilized to work upon this data, to simulate this information now, not a pure definition of big data and some of the strict machine learning that we've seen on some of our examples at this point. So example number one, you've heard previously from some of the, the presentations done by BGS, we've got a, a large investment in the UK geoenergy observatories. And these are two sites, one in Cheshire and one in uh, Glasgow. And we are going to put comprehensive sensor networks and monitoring frameworks on these two sites. These will be considerable frameworks that will deliver a large volume of data. So these are big real-time sensor networks that will give us probably for BGS some really big data sets that will expand our data volumes and what we can do. Each one of these two sites effectively is going to be a research infrastructure uh, and the documents that we have at the moment is intending to operate those for a sort of 15 year lifespan. So this is going to be real time production of information from a range of sensors on these sites 
we will obviously turn some on and off depending on what projects are being run and what tests are being done. But in reality, some of the volumes over a 15 year life cycle could be epic. So historically, what we've done for our monitoring frameworks is we've had a whole range of sensors. We've used XML gateways to harvest that information through web services and put them into a, as you would expect, a nice Oracle structured data store on which we denormalize the information within a query layer, make an API on the top of it, and then deliver to a whole range of different platforms, whether that's mobile. So, fine, it deals with instrument through to data storage through to delivery. But the question then is, it feeds systems like this at the moment, which are smaller scale environmental baseline monitoring systems that we've got running. But what happens when you scale up to the kind of data volumes that we're talking about now from these two geo observatories? So the challenges we've got are, these are not real time. We tend to do the updates on these on set cycles. So we harvest the information from the web, web client, we process it, we load it, but we haven't in reality, got those running as a consistent real-time flow. We don't do comprehensive QC for gaps, spikes, and failures within some of the sensors that we're talking about here, but that is going to be needed for a geo-observatory that you're going to fundamentally make the data openly available for use within the country. And we don't really do interactive query, and there's a controlled number of sensors. So there's got to be a shift change. So what we then need to do is think more along the techniques, and some of them you've been described to you previously within this presentations that we've had here. How do we use the new technologies within big data to actually give us a much more a data streaming hub environment where which can deal with the kind of volumes, the types of data that we're going to have? And that's where we're getting into using products like Kafka and Spark and, and actually storing and taking and processing that information to allow us to actually do some of that processing on the fly and, and realistically hold that information properly. So what we've come up with here is a new approach whereby we will use these technologies, Kafka, Spark, we will hold things on probably in, in Cassandra under the storage element. We will use products like Elasticsearch to allow us to get that real time interaction with the information so you can seriously process it on the fly, but it is not a robust single store, which is why we might also have Cassandra as the data store, and then we can have display, watch, triggers, and we can have any users and clients on the end of it. These are some of the technologies that we will be implementing in that area. And here is a slide just to explain that this is some of the technologies that are now available for use in these areas and this is this is the technologies that are routinely being used by data scientists to allow you to play and process with this information in in a real-time environment so a second example so volcanic ash observatories they are split mainly into a number of there's i think there's nine around around the world they're pretty critical because actually it's forecasting information that actually goes into the planes that are fly around the world so they can structure their routes and they know what the risk element is for, for actually taking planes around. So you want this information. <clears throat> we want this information, particularly we want it because actually this information can re feed our research within, the, within BGS. But this information is delivered by nine different organizations in different structures and in, you know, different styles, e even within one locality that looks after the information, they have different ways of naming things and different temporal IDs. But what we can do these days is we can actually start to scrape the information from disparate sources using some of the technologies that allows us to look at some of the structured information that is being made available on some of the different websites, whether it's an intranet, whether it's their website, whether it's an FTP server in the case that the one we're looking at at the moment, and we can start to identify certain key structures within that information and then write scripts to allow us to al allocate those out to certain key criteria that we're interested in and extract that to build our own database system so we can actually pull that information on the fly from other source locations. And I think this goes to the heart of the discussion from Halliburton the other day when they said, it's not really a technological problem anymore to harvest this information from many different sorts and, and, and amalgamate it 
I, I don't necessarily agree it can't be without any data model. I think there still needs to be some concept of a data model behind what you're doing, but the technology is out there now to allow you to actually do these. Once you've found the source of the information that you want, you can find ways to actually facilitate and stream this information and harvest what you need. So, in essence, what this allows us to do is actually pull this information from a research perspective from these range of different disparate locations around the world, and then we can start processing graphs off the end of it and, and actually using it to generate real scientific output. Uh, and looking at the, these two graphs on the uh, far side here are how far the ash travels up into the atmosphere. But again, it's feeding real research within different scientific disciplines within geoscience. So my third example is about paralyzing code. So this model, which is called VIC, is about dealing with hydro, hydrology and the surface water element. But the surface water element in any model is also dictated to some extent by the groundwater element, as we would know as geologists. But linking the two together is a challenge, particularly as you're trying to understand the concepts between them. But ultimately, even before you want to consider aspects of the, the, the challenge of linking those, you've, you've actually got to bring these two models together. So what they've done here is one needs to be paralyzed and interspersed with the other. And now there's a way to actually take the code and disassemble the containers and what the code is currently being run in and add in the portions of the other model to allow them to cross-relate with each other. So the last bit of my presentation, I wanted to just compare where we are. So we've heard a lot about certain oil industry companies who have made some significant headway using AI, machine learning, big data techniques, normally within their own environment, kept, understandably, quite commercially sensitive because at the end of the day, it's all money. But in reality, Stepping to one side and talking now from a, from a research point of view, this is knowledge that we should be sharing between us so we can better, you know, expand geosciences as a whole. So I just wanted to have a look at a couple of other industries or domains which effectively are, well, are considered to be well ahead of where geosciences are. So the two I decided to just have a quick look at was the life sciences, who have been into large data volumes and processing and transformations for quite a long time, and also then atmosphere, climate, a little bit of oceanography, and the examples I used was Elixir uh, and the NOAA one from America. NOAA because they've got a fundamentally large project around big data, which they've published all of the information, and they've got papers out on the web about. And Elixir because it's a very large European framework that has developed uh, you know, tools, data, interoperability, a compute platform to actually facilitate bringing the data together from different life sciences. Arguably very well funded, you might add, which is one of the things we might possibly contrast as to why we're not at the same point, but maybe they are. <coughs> so I just wanted to look at a little comparison. So traditionally, geosciences, our particular area, often small descriptive data sets. That's where we've come from. I, I fully agree we are moving now into a much more numerical domain and we're moving into real-time data and you know, data streaming. We're building up the data sets that we build, but traditionally that's where we've come from. Often our science is done in discrete or singular projects, which is where we have come from. Um, and our local infrastructure is quite often good enough for us to do the work that we want to do. That is where we have come from. Um, and that's, you know, quite often if you still talk to some of the geoscientists these days, they will do everything on their laptop or everything on their workstation. And, and, and sometimes it's quite difficult to get them to understand that they need to step to a larger level of platform and process. I think the culture of data sharing is still fairly new. You know, we, we still have some barriers between us about the real sharing of data and things are changing in that area but there, there is you know even in my time in BGS which is about 21 years from where I first turned up where it was very much my personal research as a scientist through to where we've got to now we've made huge strides but we're not the same as oceanography which has been fundamentally sharing its data across the globe for, for at least 15 plus 20 years now 
So we're not quite at the same place as those. And we're still using fairly local or regional scientific vocabularies and ontologies. Because we all, and this is the great thing about geoscientists, we all have our own classification, and MAS is the best. <laughs> and that, that, is still, that still exists. And, and, and in reality, that will break down more and more as we get together and fundamentally need to interoperate our data. But at this point, we're still a little bit behind the curve on that. Uh, and it takes some enlightened organizations to actually bring that together and try and break down some of those barriers and build standardized systems and harmonize elements of that. So let's look at life sciences and atmosphere. So they've been building, arguably, larger data sets to support their research. So they've got that culture of data sharing of the work that's been done together for longer than we have. They were very early adopters of networks and monitoring. And so they built these larger data sets. And that is their evidence base on which they're working. And therefore, one follows the other. They have larger collaborative programs and regional initiatives so they are feeding large data sets into large programs and generating even more. They are arguably slightly further evolved on their regional and global scientific vocabularies. So we're catching up. And therefore, large data sets, a history of, of generating them, a history of collaborating, a history of funders then following on and generating more funding opportunities means that they've been utilizing larger infrastructure than maybe that we have for some period of time. And that challenges are recognized quite clearly by the funding organizations who are happy to put the money up in those areas for very large programs, cross-discipline, and, and move them forward. I will put an arrow at the bottom. I don't want to be too pessimistic. We are moving our way rapidly to this environment, and that is why we're having this conference today. Because in reality, this is where we need to be as geosciences. I'd also point out there are a number of drivers pushing us in different areas around here. So open data, whether it's government driven or it's driven by a need to be able to get hold of more data to de-risk your work yourself, is driving us to change what we do. At the same time, data publication, being able to peer review the data underneath the paper or the data under the graph, as it's called, is fundamentally changing things as well. So we are expecting to see DOIs attached to some of the data sets that we're talking about. We are absolutely being pushed by funders towards larger multidisciplinary projects. And we are expected to be collaborating across different discipline boundaries these days to actually be part of those projects, those big, larger consortiums. That is what the funders are funding these days. The smaller niche within discipline Projects still exist, but they're far not as common as they were in the past. And inevitably, and that's because they cost an absolute arm and a leg, there are less infrastructures of the size that we're talking about to do some of the work that we need to do at the scale that we're talking about. So in reality, the large data storage environments, unless you work with a very large, well-funded, uh, you know, oil industry, maybe, as an example, um, and the compute processing power that you need by the side of that. You know, speaking personally as BGS, we have a certain capability in-house. We probably always will. And we will keep an element of that as a stepping stone. But at some point, we are going to have to step on beyond that and be able to scale our work up to the cloud, whatever the cloud happens to be. And whoever's providing it is a different question. But in reality, those infrastructures are not going to be built and housed by every organization. You just can't afford it. And inevitably, as some examples that we've already talked about, there are changes in IT and data architectures. And there are different things that we can do these days. We don't have to have such robust data models up front the ways that we have in the past. So the new area of geosciences, as we've mentioned, we are now very into sensor networks, monitoring platforms. We're talking about real-time and near real-time data. And that is fundamentally changing the way we think about it. That's where our projects have gone to. And that, therefore, is now the top level of the envelope we're having to deal with. And that means our systems and architectures have to cope to deal with that. If we look around, we had a presentation uh, on the first day from, uh, on geosocial, so social media data. That whole unstructured data envelope is something that actually we now need to start looking at. If that's 80% of the data that exists from now onwards, and 20% is structured 
scientific information, then it would be a, we would be a fool to, non, to miss out on the opportunities and the nuggets that might be in that 80% realm. So we need to understand how we can process that and, and move on. And at the same time, we've got business intelligence data. A lot of us have got systems that we've been logging the access to for quite some periods of time. There's a lot of information in those large data sets that we need to look at. Data standards and structures have been progressed and are being progressed and are pushed within some of the work that we do when we engage on a European or a global platform. And we de definitely need to amalgamate geoscience with the wider environmental data. We don't answer the questions that we need to answer now purely by a research in one particular area. We, it's got to be a much broader. So, last slide. What's, what work have we got to do? Well, critically, and for all you oil industry people, step outside of your business environment at the moment because it's much easier when you've actually got a, a business question to answer. We need to understand the geoscience use cases, and this is possibly one of the reasons why we've been a little slow to adopt some of the technologies and approaches that are otherwise being encapsulated within big data. If you don't have a culture of using those frameworks, you don't immediately go, oh, that's what I could do, that's what I need to write. That's the answer. So at the moment, we're still at the stage whereby we're trying to get people to encourage to use some of these technologies because they don't understand what this technology and architecture can actually provide to them. So we need to try and gather those. And they're very hard to find. That killer use case is brilliant for a different discipline. It can be something you can really pin something on. But in reality, we've got to find some of those killer use cases for geoscience and then make a big thing about them and then solve them with the frameworks and the knowledge and the access to data that we, we do have with a massive legacy that exists for the data that we all hold. We need to encourage people to use these latest IT software technologies and architectures and, and, and better use the wealth of data that is accessible that they can now scrape and assimilate and actually use within their processes. It, 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 to be successful in reality, data science has got to become a small portion of everybody's core job. It needs to be that all pervasive, ultimately. But we're still at the point whereby we've got specialist data scientists, and I would argue I've got a dot, dot, dot others at the bottom. One of the critical things that we're still struggling from is a domain expert who's also a data scientist. They're a very rare thing, and if you get one, lock them down. They're very hard to keep. But in, so that hybrid skill set, it's still not there. So I'd, I'd like to think back to think the days when GIS first hit geosciences. For a while, we had GIS experts. They were just GIS experts. We still have some GIS experts these days, but in reality, all of our staff have a fairly high familiarity with GIS as a, as a functioning skill set. And that's where we need to be with, 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 with data science as a whole. We need to recognize the value of these approaches within our domain and look for the opportunities to actually utilize them, not just the risks. There are risks. We've seen from some of the machine learning approaches. Nothing's perfect, and you can find false positives, and you can find the wrong pattern or see trends where they don't exist. But that shouldn't stop us exploring and trying to find some of the opportunities that we can find. We need to take the opportunity to push geosciences within all of the scientific programs that are around. I, I sometimes get disheartened when I go off and I talk to another group of people who are dealing with everything from the surface upwards because that's what they can see and that's what they can model. And they're completely forgetting everything under their feet. We should not be forgotten. We are everything that they are standing on and the interactions do have an effect. And it needs to be through our willingness to engage across that boundary to make sure that we are included. And we also need to build and contribute to our geoscience vocabularies and try and facilitate how we would integrate some aspects of these data. So we are tackling part of these issues ourselves, which in time will make things easier for us to, to actually integrate information. And I'm sure there's probably many others that we should add to that slide of work we could do. But if anybody wants to collar me and have a chat about it, please feel free. Thank you. <laughs>